Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to this edition of The People's Choice on the WCEG Network, the Worldwide Community Empowerment Group. So Facebook, follow me, Instagram, and gentlemen, I am blessed to have with us a one of virusly down inside of the gold dome, making sure that we, the citizens of the state of Georgia, are protected in every facet that you can think of as a citizen. That we have every right uh, as a citizen of this state of Georgia and of these United States. Uh, but she is without a doubt trying to elevate that right beyond the state of Georgia to a more national level and have her one of his own. Uh, Representative Valencia Stovall, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. How I are am you? well. Thank you, Joe, and thank you to WCEG um, Talk Radio um, for this opportunity. I definitely enjoy um, being on here and especially on the other side um, of the microphone. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It is definitely experience to be on both sides. <laughs> it really is. Representative Stovall, I I'm so grateful to have you. And I, first and foremost, let us let me thank you personally for all the work that you do. Uh, for the citizens in the Clayton County area. Uh, of course, I know that you cover a lot of areas, so I don't want to just rattle off stuff that I don't know, but thank you for, for all that you do uh, for the citizens of the state of Georgia as a whole, because not only is your reach uh, in your district, but uh, the, the things that you vote for, the things that you lobby for affect all citizens of the state of Georgia. And so we want to thank you every day for your service that you do uh, to this great state uh, and to the people that you represent. You're welcome. So let's get right into it. You know, I, 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 some people may get offended by some of the words that I'm going to say behind this, but I want to thank you for jumping out there, if you will, to seek this seat uh, in District 5 of the U.S. Representative uh, for a seat in Congress. Um, it's, Lindsay, I'm, the, it's, I'm, it's U.S. Senate seat, not District 5. U.S. US Senate, Senate seat. seat. I, my mistake. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> U.S. Senate seat. Uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, I, and I apologize because I've seen so many things has yes. taken place concerning the, the you know, the, uh, the uh, representative seat that I lost my train of thought there. But no, thank you so very much uh, for this seat that you're running for. So tell us, uh, why now? Why now have you decided to move forward uh, in this election season to run for U.S. Senate? And, uh, you know, what, what are some of the things that you want to see take place for the state of Georgia but also uh, on this level, of course, this is a national level. So what are some of the things? You So, you know, and I didn't have any opposition um, before I decided that I was going to run. So I was in the comfortable seat. But what I found that over the eight years that we've been putting bandages on, on issues that need real solutions um, right. here in the state of Georgia. And uh, because of that, I know that the solutions have to come from Washington. We can actually see how dependent we are on the policies and those that are in charge or those who are elected um, to be able to benefit and make sure that everyone in uh, the state of Georgia across the United States are receiving the services that they need. And so I want to take my eight years of experience as a legislator working across the aisle uh, with both Republicans and Democrats. It's one of the reasons I'm running as an independent. And I also want to take my 30 years of business uh, experience and my 30 years of community resource experiences uh, to Washington, D.C., to be able to elevate the services and things that I've already been able to do here uh, for my district uh, in Clayton County and even statewide on some initiatives that I've done. So I want to take all of that to Washington, D.C. I don't need any training wheels. I understand policy and how they work very well. Well, that, listen, you heard it from, for lack of a better phrase, the horse's mouth there. She doesn't need any training wheels, and that's a good thing. You know, quite often we have people going in uh, who are doing OJT, 
uh, when it comes to this type of role. And so we appreciate the fact that you already know and have the background and the knowledge of what's taking place uh, in our nation. So, uh, you know, Representative Stovall, it's very rare that we find someone to run on an independent ticket uh, here in the state of Georgia. You know, everybody, well, nationwide, of course, but here in the state of Georgia, you know, everybody's either focusing on the Democratic ticket or on the Republican ticket. How did you decide that when running for this office, you decided to do so as an independent? Um, yes, and I'm glad that you asked, and every time someone asks, I'm excited that they're asking. There are two parties that are just right. recognized, uh, which means that you do not have to go and get signatures um, in order to get on the ballot. And right. so if you're a Democrat, Democrat or Republican that's running, and that, those are laws we need to change because we need a balance on our ballot boxes when we're voting. You need to be able to, as a voter, have a choice of all the candidates that want to run. Um, and so what happens when you run as an independent during a regular election, you would have to be required to get a percentage of votes uh, of signatures saying that they want you to represent them on the ballot. And then after you go through that whole process, then you still have to go through the regular election to go back and ask you know those people to vote, actually vote for you um, during the uh, election. It's a lot. And I, to me, I think it's punishing. But what happened, this is a special election. Um, Senator Johnny Isaacson retired last year. He has two years left on his term because it's a six-year term for a senator. And so the governor made an appointment, uh, but the people have to decide who they want to represent them uh, in Washington, D.C. in the Senate seat. There are only two Senate seats per state. So it's a total of 100 senators in the United States of uh, Uh, being a victim, uh, so to speak, of what happens when you vote outside of the party. And I'm a Democrat um, elected oh, official. Yes. And so I've battled many times. I've been in the newspaper about voting, you know, not with the party. I've been ostracized by my colleagues uh, for not doing it. But I believe my vote was the right vote. And anytime I feel like I'm doing the right thing, I'm going to stand, even if I have to stand alone. And many times I have had to stand alone. So being able to run as an independent frees me to not have to worry about the criticism, being ostracized uh, from the party uh, because of what leadership says how you should vote, but that might not necessarily be how the people need you to vote. You know, Representative Stovall, one of the things that I have always said that if I ever ran for office, you know, I would probably be like you ostracized or kicked out because I would not follow the party bosses. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate you know, in our nation, in our state, that if you don't go along with what the big party says, then you are, you know, kicked to the side or they don't look at you the same as everybody else. And, you know, the truth of the matter is you have to be an independent uh, in order to make change uh, in our area. So thank you so much for, you know, taking that, uh, that step to be an independent uh, in this race. So then the next question I have for you is who are your opponents, you know, in, in your particular race? Well, um, Joe, it's a rule when you are an a elected official and you're running for office, you do not say your oh, opponent's yeah. names. I just um, thought I'd get recognition you. to my <laughs> staff, Stovall, that's all, that's all who I'm focusing on. <laughs> that's who I know is the best qualified Right, candidate. right. And so, but I, what I will say to the listeners is that you should definitely investigate and look up the candidates. They say, if you can Google U.S. Senate special election, you'll see all the candidates' names. Um, come up. I will say that there are 21 candidates in this particular race because it's an open, uh, open when it's a special election, which means that anybody that wants to run, they paid the qualified fee and they were able to be on the ballot. That's correct. I just thought I'd mess with you there a little That's bit, right. Representative. <laughs> Listen, let me ask this question. Going back to a statement that you made just a minute ago, how do we here in the state of Georgia make it or or make the change needed? so that there is the possibility of an independent voter. You know, to your point, when you go in for the uh, primary elections, you have to decide, you know, whether or not you're going to vote as a Republican or if you're going to vote as a Democrat, which again limits you to only voting for people based on that party. Now,
home and used it uh, not for the people. Right. You know, and, and that's for both parties. That's not the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. I've seen where it has happened for both parties, where they've used it for their advantage and not for the people. So how can the citizens of Georgia or how can even in your role, if elected uh, or when elected as U.S. Senate, how can. or they can sign it into law. So there are several things that can happen. And it's gonna take the people, believe it or not, um, the last research that I was able to obtain, there are about 1.3 million independents of people that, that consider themselves to be independent. And that's a lot, you know. You is that, is that, that state, I'm sorry, is that in, in state, Georgia? In Georgia. In the state, gotcha, in Georgia. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, and then many people I've been running into while on the campaign trail, have really surprised me that I thought were, you know, straight, you know, Democrats, I'm giving my right, right. And they said, oh, no, I'm glad you're running as independent. Oh, I'm <laughs> right, independent. Right. So just like you right. said, I look at the candidate and see who's going to best, you know, suit my interest Correct. at that particular time that I'm voting. So I think as people now, the ties are changing so much in the political arena. Um, you can see what's going on in Washington, D.C. when it comes down to making a decision to send additional money and funds and resources to the people. And now right. it's caught up between which party is going to get the win, who's going to have the win. And right. it should not be like that. But Correct. when you have that third person that's there that's looking at both sides, then and you get more right now. There are only two independents on the Senate side. Bernie Sanders, who ended up running as a Democrat right. um, in the primary, but go, still is an independent. Right. And then there's another gentleman, last name King, um, who's the independent? So there are only two independents in the Senate uh, right now out of the 100 um, senators. Wow, that, that's, that's good information and amazing information. But it also shows how the parties have made or have had control for so many years and really don't want to relinquish their control oh, no. because then there becomes a challenge, you know, like you, there becomes a challenge to the status quo of the party. So, Representative Stovall, tell us what do we have to look forward to uh, when you are elected as a U.S. Senator in the state of Georgia? Well, definitely um, continuing to fight for what I know is right. One of the things I did want to say was that um, I actually was a co-sponsor on a bill that was introduced uh, by a Democratic legislator um, to add the independent as a third party in the state of Georgia. Right. Of course, it did not get a hearing, uh, committee hearing, uh, which is the first initial part of the step for passing. So there's been a flavor there, and we're going to continue to push. So that's one thing. Uh, right. There are three areas that I'm going to be focusing on, which does not uh, steer too far from what I've always done as a state legislator. Uh, but now on, it'll be on the national Being there, you should have already been doing some versions of virtual um, learning, which we had some charter schools that were online charter schools were doing it, and they didn't miss a beat except for going through the crisis of COVID. But when it came down to the structure of distance learning, it was no issue. Uh, and right. so, and I think that every high school student should graduate with a trade, a certification in a trade, which puts them into the job market with a higher wage or paying because the market is going to determine what that pay is. Um, and also, uh, we have dual enrollment, so definitely continue to push for more funding and support for dual enrollment uh, for our students. And then also apprenticeship programs. So pushing more from the federal level down for apprenticeship programs for our young people and for adults uh, to get into apprenticeship programs as well. Uh, second one under there is support small business growth. Uh, our small business, our micro small businesses, did not fare well and are not faring well during COVID-19. Correct. It came down to SBA loans that were issued out. Many of them didn't qualify for it. Even the payroll protection uh, program, many did not qualify for it. And a lot of times they just needed some help and resources to help tell them what to fill out 
how to get it in, but that was not a priority here in the state of Georgia when it came to micro small businesses. So wow. one of the first things I'll be uh, fighting for is a reclassification of small business, the, the definition of small business, to now include micro small businesses in that classification. Um, next is government efficiency. Uh, having insurance and a well-run government um, that is fiscally sound. And up under that, of course, you have health care. There should be quality and affordable health care for everyone. It should not be depending on whether you have a job or not as to whether what quality of health care you're going to have. Our immigration system needs fixing, um, and, and we need to be fair uh, about that. So there's some changes we need to make there. Our infrastructure. So now we're doing distance learning, many areas in rural Georgia, do not have access to broadband. That's that's now the students had to, you know, suffer a lot, had to go to parking lots of, of restaurants or to the library just to complete their um, their assignment. And so all those things need to be there. So that's what we talk about government efficiency. I think there should be awareness and access. I call it double A. We need to be aware of what those resources are and we need access to them. Lastly is um, global stewardship. Um, let me go back to the government efficiency. Justice reform is in there as well. Right. So that's a part of the conversation. Uh, global stewardship, we, we're not an island by ourselves here in the world. And we don't, we don't possess all of the um, resources, natural resources that are needed in order to produce things that we need to be able to um, have here in the United States. And so having good international relations um, and global programs uh, with our foreign um, neighbors is going to be very, very essential, especially those trade programs. When I talk about small businesses, um, right. is, uh, is also essential. And having a sustainable environmental uh, practices uh, that we're doing, because we're hearing a lot about climate change. You see all the fires that are going on in the West, all the floods that are going on in the South. Uh, all of that has to do with climate, the things that we're not doing. So really pushing and making sure that we have some good policies in place and that people are educated about what does it mean when we right. hear climate change, greenhouse gases, and all of those things. Well, you know, Representative Stovall, you said a true mouthful in that. But one thing I want to go back to is the SBA, the small or just the small business thing that you mentioned there. Uh, because I don't think, you know, and, you know, kind of uh, piggybacking on the education uh, piece of it. A lot of Americans don't really know how what small how small business is defined, mm -hmm. uh, and and I don't want to quote it because I can't remember. But when I looked at it some time ago, I saw that small business, you know, in in my mindset would be a mom and pop store, you know, around the way. But small businesses are some that are making millions of dollars a year, and that still falls under the small business uh, sector. So I, I'm I'm grateful and glad to hear. You mentioning about the micro uh, business or how you know micro small business uh, because there's not enough uh, attention and focus placed on the businesses who you know who don't make the income or you know the money that uh, some of the defined small businesses uh, do in the U.S. and so I'm glad to hear that there's focus uh, on that in addition to the fact that you you said it, uh, awareness and action I think are very two important things uh, because, you know, something that uh, one of my mentors, uh, God rest his soul, Reverend Albert E. Love, used to always say is that, you know, truth of the matter is most Americans don't have time. And then you have, you know, individuals like yourself and I, where you're gainfully involved in it, but I keep my eye on it, who, you know, who just love this type of stuff and who, who focus on it. But to the average American, they don't have, they don't, they are not aware, nor do they know the actions uh, that take place in making any of these things law uh, into legislating any of these things. And so I'm glad to hear that even you, you know, want to make sure that people are again, focused and aware and educated, if you will, uh, on these topics. So what does this campaign look like for you right now? How has it been? I mean, I know it's been a lot uh, going on uh, and it's different, you know, in this environment. So how has the campaign trail been in this COVID environment? Uh, it definitely has been challenging. Um, 
you, you know, being able to use the skills and um, resources and talents and experiences from the past eight years. Um, my dad had been always been involved in campaigning. Um, it's growing up. So using all of that knowledge, um, knowledge base from there has really kept us afloat. Um, it's been challenging um, because under the normal circumstances, you're able to get out, greet people, meet people, let them right, see right. you, you know, face to face, ask questions. So now we've been resulted to Zoom or online platform, which uh, we uh, started off right after um, when COVID was announced, holding listening tours. We were doing webinars. Um, I've been doing a Facebook Live Friday um, since April. So April Friday at 6 p.m. Um, I have everybody tune in. We talk about different subjects. Last week, we talked about women's health. Um, this Friday, actually, we're going to have someone talk about independent races um, right. here in Georgia and even nationally. Um, so, and then raising the funds that are needed, uh, then um, running as an independent is challenging because in itself because people don't understand. Right. And they ask right. the question, why don't you just run as a Democrat? I said, why do I have to just settle for being a, on the Democratic ticket? Well, I want right. to run for independent because this is truly who I am. And that's who you want you to represent the person to be who they are. And, uh, and so it's just been challenging. But one of the things, the good positive side is that we have been able to reach people um, through online, and then we just kind of been telling you use the grapevine. You know, when you say that, you think about that song, my Gladys and I heard it through the grapevine, we need them to hear through oh, the yeah. grapevine about this election. And to reach out to your family and friends and tell them to vote Stovall, that's all. Uh, check out our website at gostovall.com. Stovall, that's all. <laughs> Stovall, that's all. We're number 16 on the ballot. Other thing I wanted to stress was this is a very historical race um, for me and for those in Georgia, the voters. Uh, once elected, I will be the first African American woman to ever be a U.S. Senator from the state of Georgia. That's um, also from any Southern state uh, in the United States. And I will be the third to ever serve in the United States of America uh, in the nation as a U.S. Senator. So it's very historic. And the important part about that is that we need to have our voice, the voice of black women at the table when you're discussing issues. There are only 100 senators, about 46 males, 26, um, uh, was more than 46 males, but 26 women currently serve. And if Kamala goes to vice president, that means we would not have a black woman at all uh, in the US Senate. And you know, mm -hmm. there are many issues that we are facing and if you don't have a voice or a seat at the table, then your voice gets muzzled and it gets lost in the mix uh, when discussions or policies are, are being put in place. And so I just want to make sure I stress that uh, to, you, to the listeners about how historic, and not only being historic as was the first black woman, but the black woman who has experience, I'm qualified. I've proven over the eight years that I can work like I said, across the aisle and being able to compromise. I see the value of both sides um, in both parties. Um, and I'm able to use those skills I've learned at the state capitol. I've been very successful, brought $45 million uh, grant to my county because of the loss of the jet fuel tax money. Have held um, Educate Georgia Summit, which is a statewide event for three mm -hmm. years, over a thousand people. Even had Governor Deal to come in as our keynote speaker all three years. And so that, you know, that says a lot when you talk about a legislator um, being able to talk with both sides and get, the, get things done. That's a, that's a huge thing to be able to talk because, uh, you know, not, not often do we see uh, bipartisanism uh, in any level. You know, there's always talk of it, but you don't always see it. Uh, here in the state or on the national level, do you see people working across the aisles? People try to use that, but they don't do it. Again, kind of going back to the fact that some parties just push what they want uh, on both sides. Representative Stovall, you have done so much uh, for the great state of Georgia, and it looks as if though you're going to do a lot uh, for our nation. So for those listeners who, who don't know who Valencia Stovall is, give us some of the background of, of you know, your upbringing and how you got into politics as a whole. Right, I was born and raised on, um, in Southeast Atlanta, uh, graduated from Southside um, High School, which is now Maine Jackson High School, and um, attended Fort Valley State College, um, also Georgia State College. Um, moved to Clayton County in 2006, 
and I uh, was not thinking about running for any office. We had our business, uh, small um, family business, customized printing. And, I, and actually in 1991, um, because of the policies that City of Atlanta had for minority participation, we were the first black company to have a joint venture partnership at the Georgia Dome. And nice. so we sold everything except for food. So if you came to the Dome from 92 up to 2008 and you went to any of those merchandise stands, those were the stands we were in charge of for those, for those number of years. Nice. And so, um, you know, when I talk about small business, I know how the struggle is for minority businesses. We've been there still, you know, still having issues uh, even now. And so my dad was always involved in politics when Mayor Manny Jackson um, decided to run for office. Uh, my dad helped in that election. He was elected as the first black mayor of the city of Atlanta in the inner southern city. And mm -hmm. he ran again um, some years later. My dad was there with Shirley Franklin who was elected as uh, Atlanta's first woman and first black woman mayor. Right. My dad was there helping her in her election as well. So he helped many state representatives and senators, um, even on the national level as far as the President Carter with his peanut brigade. Many probably don't, don't know about that, but some right. do, right. older ones. Um, so he was a part of the peanut brigade when they went to Washington, D.C. And so he's always been involved in us, my two sisters and myself were always you know, going along with him, <laughs> campaigning. And when the end of our friends that came over, guess what? They were campaigning too. So, uh, but when I moved to Clayton County uh, in 2012, I was there in 2006, but in 2012, the state representative seat became open because the person who had it decided to run uh, for another seat. And so my dad said, won't you run? And I was like, no, I know my mouth is going to get me in trouble. Because <laughs> uh, somebody say something, how to correct, you know, this and that. He's right, like, right, uh, right. You know, you're not doing nothing else. Go ahead and run. And right. I said, okay, we'll put our hats in. And so here we are eight years later, being successful um, each election uh, cycle uh, with being able to go back because I always kept the people, the needs of the people in front of me um, right. at all times. Right. So, you know, that, that last statement there is what means the most, the needs of the people. I think often, you know, when we consider or just, you know, the, the uh, average American considers an elected official, they have this thought press process now that most elected officials really don't care about the needs of the people. You know, I have to say, and I think you may agree that this has been, you know, without a doubt, a very different uh, uh, election year. And I have never seen in my life so much emphasis on voting and i'm i'm always an advocate for voting i always have been and have just tried without a doubt to push it better than anybody else but i have never seen so many get out to vote um strategies or so many get out to vote um uh, advertisements i mean it's everywhere every place i turn there's something about voting so with that being said i understand that there are still some things concerning um, voting for, you know, African Americans being able to have the right to vote. What are your thoughts or how do you think that we moving forward, if, it, you know, when elected that Senate, how do we, you know, get rid of that voter apathy that some African Americans hold? How do we make sure that the Voting Rights Act is, it's, you know, signed for the rest of, of uh, eternity, that it is not something that we have to continue to re-up? Yeah. Definitely, um, you should have never had to reconstitute the Voting Rights Act, period. Right, right, you know, if, right. if voting uh, was established in our Constitution as part of democracy and the democratic process, then, and if white America is allowed to vote, it should have been the same for Black America. And, and even after the Civil, civil uh, War, even after the Civil Rights, there have been a a issue that we have to continue to bring over any changes that need to be made in the Voting Rights Act. It should not be it. Uh, but I right. think we have to start with our young people younger. We're educating them on the process of why it's important to have, uh, while we have the U.S. democracy set up the way it is. Yeah, we take some classes in high school a little bit, but they don't really make it bring it down home where it's applicable, right. where people can actually um, know um, that it applies directly to him, to them. So I think better uh, informed civic classes. Uh, one project I was working on, uh, still there working on before COVID, 
was educating people doing jury duty. Mm. And so being able to talk to them, because you're sitting there, you can't go anywhere. <laughs> so have a screen, an education screen up there about what each position that's elected, what is the definition of it. Don't have the people's name, but have the position. And that uh-huh. helps people to understand, you know, as you are being a juror, you're voting on based on what the law says and what your interpretation is, whether somebody's guilty or not. But there are policymakers that you elect that come up with those laws that you are uh-huh. deciding on, in, you know, as a juror. And your everyday life is decided on by policy. So I think starting at a younger okay. age, um, I know right now in the state of Georgia, you could be 17 and a half to vote. There's even been talk to even lowering it to 17 years of age so that those high school students, because they're going to soon be aging out, uh, right. that they are allowed to be able to, uh, to vote as well. So I think that uh, we definitely have to do more of that. And we should not have to be pushing vote, vote, vote so hard like we're doing now. Yes. Um, and I tell everybody, if you need a motivation to vote, look at what's happening with COVID-19. If you're right. okay with everything that's happening with COVID-19, stay at home, don't vote. No, and, but don't say nothing. Don't complain. Right. If you're not all right with what happened with COVID-19, because it's policy, whether the policies were in place were effective or ineffective, they still were policies made by elected officials. And so if you don't like it, that's why that's enough motivation for you to go and vote. That, that's that you've heard it, ladies and gentlemen, here first on WCEG uh, from Representative Stovall. You know, it's 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 crazy to me. Again, I, I've never seen the biggest push for voting. And, and I mean, again, you know, I've been involved and engaged in this, you know, more than 20 years now, and I've never seen so much push, so much engagement for voting. And I agree with you, you know, why now is there a bigger push for it than ever before? Uh, but we know, we know, you know, what powers it be that are trying to take place to make everybody to vote. But it's, it's very, it's, um, it's, it's something to look at. So, you know, kind of going back to the Voting Rights Act, how do we, why do you think at all that maybe we in the African American community kind of settled with what was there and didn't ask for it to be? Uh, you know, anything more than something that has to be signed into law every few years. Um, you know, what can we do? Or can we just make it? I guess the question is, what needs to be done so that that's not something that we continue to have to sign into law or vote to be signed into law? How can we make this happen? Um, definitely uh, by just what we're doing now. We're lifting up our voices and not just, you know, Black America, but White America, Asian America. It should right. be everyone lifting up the same yeah. voice like we talk about matter. And right. you've seen a mixture. It's not just Black people out there that, that are protesting or demonstrating. Right. There are right. people in creed. And so it should be the same when it comes down to voting, because we know that we're in a country that the voting determines who your elected officials are going to be. Mm-hmm. Except for, you know, of course, when you get to the president and vice president, that's a whole nother conversation about the electoral college and national right. popular vote. Um, right. But for everything else from your U.S. Senate, U.S. House of Representatives, um, your state elected officials, House and, and Senate, your judges, your governor, your superintendent, all of those are elected by popular vote. Right. And so if you're not uh, able to vote and if there are barriers put in, in front of you, like, um, you know, you have to, even when you come to, down to your ID, we right. uh, I know we've loosened up a lot in the state of Georgia that even if you don't have an ID, you can get it from the voter uh, elections yeah. office now. Right. You know, of course, you just sh- have to show proof. But there's so much, I think that even with early, um, with voting, period, on the day of election, you should be able to vote at any precinct uh, within your county because there's a list. You think about it, doing early voting and advanced voting, you can go to any of those areas. They're not yeah. even your precinct. Right. They have a list because what happens when you go in to, reg- I mean, go in to get your voting card, they, it's already uploaded on that card personally just for you. So right. what's the difference to expanding it during general election? Because I know I saw during the primary, so many people got turned away because they right. were at the wrong pre- polling precinct. And Correct. you might say, well, they should remember that. Well, they don't go and vote, but every two years or four years. Correct. So that's Correct. not something that stays on their mind. You know, except for those fanatics, the people that love voting. I know oh, yeah. my precinct is. Um, so I think it should be made easier uh, when it comes to voting. To the point where we're able to vote online. You don't even have to leave the house. We do mm-hmm. banking online. 
And if the banks can secure our personal information, why can't it be with voting? Voting is not that much more when it comes down to banking. So right. utilize the same type of technology to secure our vote. That way you can vote at any time. You open it up so you got this amount of time to vote. You can go, go online and vote. Your vote is cast. Then when it comes down to the results, you got the results that are in. Right, right. That that that's huge. You know, especially when we take into consideration the the type of cybersecurity and things that are out there. There's no reason why we should not be able to do uh, this. So I agree. I completely agree. You know, going back on something that you mentioned about, um, I want to say, uh, prison reform and things of that nature. You know, we see so much now in in our society. We see there has been, or at least it seems there's been a constant attack on you know, young African-American men and women, uh, and they're being senselessly killed, um, excuse me, by you know, police officers and some vigilantes who are, you know, or like I'd like to call them Second Amendment junkies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who just feel like they have the right to just fire their weapon at anybody. You know, we just witnessed or saw you know, recently that none of the officers uh, in the uh, Breonna Taylor case are, you know, really being charged with her death. And um, there are several other, you know, conversations. in the contents of, I know two people who recently got their gun license. And in my opinion, neither one of them need it. Uh, but, you know, what steps, what needs to take place further in, in, uh, in order to ensure that we don't have these senseless killings by the police department? And, and I'm making this a longer question than need, but I kind of want to go to the point of even with the Black Lives Matter thing saying defund the police. Is that, is that realistic? I mean, can we really defund the police? And if so, will that make the difference in making them not, you know, kill, senselessly kill young African-American men and or women? And what more do we need to do concerning prison reform? I know that was a lot there, and, but I know that you are a, a trained professional at this, so you'll come out on top <laughs> with it. Uh, well, you know, we look at justice reform, um, you know, you have to take, you have to always look at history. Um, we look at what happened during Lyndon B. Johnson um, when he was uh, was the president, president and all of those initiatives that he put in place that were not advantageous um, to African-Americans. And then you go push forward to the war on drugs, uh, which locked up many of our African-American men, took them away right. from their families for long sentences. These weren't like six months or you had 20 or 30 cents for nonviolent offenses. Right. And right. so... Uh, so now you have a whole gap where there's not been a black male in the in the household, in the family, um, and, un, and understanding what's been going on. When they do get out, they try to get reacclimated re back into uh, society. And even now, some of our laws, to me, are very, very too harsh for nonviolent uh, offenders. Uh, and so when you talk about justice reform, you have to think about the mindset that has been put in place um, for, uh, against, or against uh, African Americans when it comes down to crime. It's like they automatically feel that you're guilty because right. of, the, of your skin color. You don't have time to, to say that you're not, oh, I know you must have done it. Uh, and so right. you trying to change your mindset, you cannot legislate people's mindset. They're not gonna change, I don't care how much legislation you put in place. But right. what's important is to have barriers in there that won't allow them to um, violate those policies that are in place. So for our police uh, department, our locally now, just so that everybody know, on the state and the federal level, we actually build a framework of what that justice reform is supposed to be like. On the local level, the actual policies are put in place by your mayor, city council, right. your county commissioners, those are, and your school board, because some school boards have their own police department. Right. So it's imperative as citizens that you're involved and there should be some type of citizen review board on each one of those levels so that citizens are involved in that process. And so with that, you have to put it in that human relations. Um, we had Norman Carter, 
who was a guest on my show, uh, who also is on WCEG. And right. that's one of the things, the recommendations he made about having those human relation um, training. And that means how do you relate to the people of the community that you're serving? You, right. Some things you should not say to blacks, some you don't say to the Hispanic, some you don't, some things you don't say to Asian, but you have to be conscious of that. So those type of things. Now you asked about the defund the police. Uh, when you hear that terminology, people think that that means closing down the police department. No, it does not mean right. closing down the police right. department. Right. We would not, I wouldn't want to live anywhere that we got to close down the police department. Because <laughs> right. that's my public safety. I want to be able to live somewhere where I feel safe. I want right. to be able to shop where I feel safe. I right. want to enjoy and have entertainment where I feel safe. So we need our public safety officers. And I appreciate all of them that are not bad cops. Right. All of them are not bad cops. Uh, they're caught in a situation uh, that now everybody feel or believe they are, but they're not. Yes. Right. And so what it means is that re-looking at the, how the budget is formulated for the police department. And there are some areas where they might be uh, have too much money they spend in some areas. So rearranging or realigning those funds uh, can also help. So say like community policing, where we used to have officer friendly uh, in our schools that used to come around and then even right. in our communities. It's nothing right. wrong with going back and seeing how we can implement community policing uh, in, our, in some of our communities. But that takes funding. And so that's some of the funding that can come out of the police department. But it's gonna take the community and the police department and the elected officials all working together so that the trust can be rebuilt because right now there's not a lot of trust and there's not a lot of trust with the police department to the community you feel like they're going to trust their decision and then vice versa there's not a whole lot of uh, trust from the community to the police department i i agree wholeheartedly the trust factor has really fallen uh almost to a level of zero you know like you i and most you know, sane-minded individuals understand and know that we need policemen to patrol and protect, uh, you know, our 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 um, our environment, our homes, and you know where we work and eat, live, and play. Uh, people know that, uh, but you know, thank you for kind of breaking it down even more because there's this misconception that you know that you know the police department won't have funding. Uh, but reallocating those funds is something that's very important. And I remember in elementary school. As a matter of fact, our officer friendly was one of our classmates' mother. Uh, mm -hmm. So I remember, you know, very well uh, having officer friendly uh, come to us. Uh, Representative Stovall, you mentioned, you know, uh, immigration, which is continuing to be a huge, huge topic uh, in the U.S. Um, and, you know, it's always amazing to me because we are a country of immigrants. <laughs> How is it that we spend so much time trying to get rid of people who really come to America for, for the very same thing that we pride ourselves uh, on being? Now, should there be, you know, a, a system? I agree. Uh, but, you know, how can, you know, is the system that's in place working? Clearly not. So what are some of the things that you see as a U.S. Senator that need to be done? Uh, to there definitely needs to be a better pathway to citizenship. Right. Um, yes, we have some people that snuck over here to America. Right. Um, but like you said, one of the things was they were trying to get a, a better life. Not saying I'm not agreeing to them sneaking to America, right, right, but right. they're here. And, uh, and I think that even before deporting them, there should be a process in place. Right. Um, the children that are, that are brought here, uh, they become DACA, a DACA of students, that are undocumented, right. uh, undocumented um, students. <clears throat> but because they're here in America, our laws say that they are eligible for free education. Right. And so that means <clears throat> they're acclimated into our school system. And if we don't um, um, look at how do we make their pathway better, just like with any child, if they don't have a stable home environment, that's gonna be, that's gonna destabilize them in school right. and even as right. they become an adult. And so if we can look at our immigration system and look at those who may have already um, uh, been here for a certain amount of time and they have not done any harm or gotten in any trouble, uh, then look at not necessarily making them permanent citizens, but give them uh, some type of um, citizen, uh, allowance of them being able to be here to be able to work legally and right. pay taxes legally right. so they don't have to be doing stuff under the table 
Uh, and also when you have those asylum seekers um, having with um, pa easier um, passage or a pathway for immigration uh, for them. And even those who want to bring their family members over, there's a way that we can do that, that it doesn't, uh, they don't, that nobody misuses that into trying to get into, um, into citizenship. So there's a lot of changes that can be done with immigration. And I think by talking to those who have gone through that process, and being able to hear from them as to how the steps were, what are ways that they, they need to be uh, be changed and altered to make it better. Right. Because one other thing, I, the, the death of students, one thing I did want to mention, that's unfortunate, this is something that the state law can change. Uh, they're charged, when they graduate from our Georgia high school, uh, they're charged out-of-state tuition if they want to attend a, 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 a college here in Georgia, one of our public mm -hmm four-year or two-year college. That's news to me. I didn't know that. Yes, and, and it's crazy because when right. it's out of state, that's three times as tuition as their um, their classmate is able to pay as, as American citizens. Right, right. Representative Stovall, I, I have to ask you this question. Do you think our president has done any good? Or has he done a good job? Does he need to be removed? Uh, what are some of the things, if any, uh, do you think that he has done that have been positive uh, to America? Again, if any. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, that's a decision that I want that the U.S. citizens, uh, U.S. voters um, have to make. Um, I reserve my own personal uh, opinion. I think that, of course, um, we, we've seen a lot of change, a lot of challenges to our Because at the end of the day, the people have to decide, is that okay that uh, we have violations that are being made or one person making decisions and really going beyond what we know America Now we're right. the laughing stock of, of <laughs> other countries that saying, what? Is that what you all think America should be? Right. Oh, no, we, we think we might want to stay over here and keep what we have. And right. then we're right. also hypocritical as a country when it comes down to human rights. You know, mm -hmm. we try to go into other countries and tell them about how they should be doing. And look what's happening on our own shores. Look I was what's a soldier. Back, I know. I've know, seen it. America, yeah. uh, for many years, <laughs> look what's happened with those people that are in the uh, detention centers, even what happened here in Irwin Center uh, with those women being sterilized against their own will. So those are dehumanized things, but we want to try to lift up that we owe this great America, but we got some laundry that we need to clean out, this very right. dirty laundry <clears throat> that needs to be cleaned out before we even go and try to tell another country what to do. You're absolutely, you're absolutely right, absolutely right. Here's a question. Uh, I have for you uh, concerning, you know, kind of piggybacking a little bit more on the president. So we've seen recently in the New York Times uh, that apparently that his first year in office as president and, you know, subsequently some years before that he only paid $750 in tax, $750 in tax. The so-called billionaire pay $750 in taxes. So the question is really not even focused on him. But the question is, how is it that someone of his caliber who makes the amount of money that he makes can get away with paying $750 in tax, whereas you and I, you know, who barely make enough to, you know, to do what we do every day uh, and look forward to tax time so that we can get back just a little bit of what we have spent. How does something like that happen? Where is the hiccup? Uh, because that, that has to be a, a legislative 
thing somewhere in there? Where's the hiccup in something like that? Well, definitely sometimes I believe we have um, Lot. And right, so I think right. it needs to be an equalization when it comes down to, you know, fair taxation without representation. You know, right. that's not what we're supposed to have here in, in America. And so I think definitely looking, we looking at our tax base, or how we are taxing um, those that are higher, the, the corporations that are on that higher end, even individuals that are on the higher end. Right. Um, and making sure that it's fair uh, across the board. And I think the only way you're able to determine that is that you're bringing those parties to the table. You have to have those that are lower earning, um, smaller uh, smaller business people, those that are corporations and say, hey, we need to make this thing uh, fair. You know, $750, I thought that they had made it, maybe made a mistake when I heard it. <laughs> I, I, said, maybe I thought maybe the maybe exact same thing. Like, that can't be right. That like, can't you be know, right. The, the average citizen, if we don't pay our IRS bill, the I, the R, and the S is going to knock on our everything. door. It's going to freeze our <laughs> account. Right. You know, and everything. But what happens is because you have loopholes in the tax laws that when these corporations are filing their taxes, they would write off this, write off that, write off this, write off that. The average citizen or average small business owner right. might not be able to write off all those things and get the maximum um, um, credit on their taxes that right. the larger corporations are able to get. So that's what needs to be changed is how those um, those tax policies are put in place and re-looking at it because that's definitely not fair because what happens is if you not have someone only paying $750, guess what? They're going to be free and nilly when it comes down to how much money they're giving out. Right, because it's right. not their taxpayer money. It's the, other, the, working, the working folks' taxpayer money. And Absolutely. then you want to be standing and want to give it out to a certain class of people and not mm. to everybody. And that's where it becomes unfair. Like you, Representative Stovall, I thought for sure that was a typo. I went like four or five times to search and make sure that I read that right. I could not believe it. I was just in awe. And, you know, it kind of goes back to the statement you made a little while ago. It's up to the American people, because if if we can allow something like that to continue and allow someone who is the leader of our free nation to get away with something like that that just that that speaks very volumes to the you know to to what we uh, as americans value on a regular basis representative Stovall, i think we've almost come down uh to our time here but i wanted to give you an opportunity here and first of all let me say thank you 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 really outlined so much here for us and it gave us a lot to think about and a lot to focus on you know moving into this election but I want you to give us, give the people, give the listeners reasons why they should vote Valencia Stovall for U.S. Senate. Well, that's what I'm running uh, to be able to have an independent voice for you in Washington, uh, D.C. as a U.S. Senator. I'll be one of two senators representing you and your voice. I have 30 years of experience as a legislator. here in the state of Georgia is mimicked according to what the federal government is. I don't need any training wheels to start on day one as being um, your representative there in the U.S. Senate. And I want to also say, historically, I will be the first Black or African-American woman elected to represent in the U.S. Senate to serve as U.S. Senate from Georgia. We've never had a Black woman to serve. Uh, we have never had a Black woman to serve in the Senate from any of the Southern states. And I will be the third to ever serve in the whole United States ever since we've had a Senate, uh, a Senate yes. makeup. And there are only a hundred senators. And as you can see coming up, this is a very crucial uh, position because we do determine uh, whether the nomination from the president for executive uh, positions will be approved or not. And so I definitely need your support. I need your prayers. And if you would like to make a donation to the campaign, go to ghostoverall.com. 
um, to make a donation, to volunteer, to get the word out. We need you to get the push the word out about this campaign uh, and the work that I'm going to be able to do. We're going to make sure that you have access and awareness. I call it double A. So just think Stovall, that's all. I'm the number 16 on the special election section of the ballot. And so I appreciate WCEG. I think I appreciate you, Joe, uh, for this interview. And we're very looking forward to November the 3rd. Do not wait to November 3rd to vote. Vote early. It starts October the 12th through October the 30th, uh, where you can be able to cast your ballot vote and vote. If you want to vote absentee, you can. You have to put in an application to request your ballot. And you don't have to mail your ballot. They have drop boxes in each one of the counties. Uh, has designated drop box and look just like a mailbox. So you would uh, complete your ballot, make sure you sign it, seal it, and put it in that drop box. But vote Stovall, that's all. I love it. I love it. One other thing, uh, Representative Stovall, before you go, I, I want to ask you, uh, and you can give another plug at the end of this if, if need. Uh, but I forgot to ask this question early on. We've seen uh, here recently, uh, you know, we've lost some giants in the civil rights uh, icon. Uh, one of being uh, one of which being U.S. Uh, Congressman John Lewis, um, and of course you know C.T. Vivian. We've also lost uh, Joe Lowry this year. We, we've lost a lot, but specifically focusing on on John Lewis, um, and and I say this in respect to him. I have a great deal of respect for Representative Lewis, but I see often uh, in races such as his, uh, in, well in positions such as his, that you know even in illness, sometimes they won't step aside to allow, you know, another generation or someone else to come in and, you know, being able to make the change, uh, which barks the question of term limits for U.S. Congress, uh, and, you know, in the U.S. Senate. What do you think about term limits uh, for, for Congress? I definitely think that there should be term limits uh, for Congress uh, because uh, sometimes you can stay too long. Um, you have, you know, you need that experience there, but like you said, there's time where it's time to move on. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons I decided to not stay as a state representative for a long time. I did my eight years. Is that that, that allow someone else to come in right. and, uh, and bring their fresh ideas and energy mm -hmm. uh, there in that position. And I think that do, should be, but I do want to caution everyone you start talking about term limits. Remember, you do have the bureaucracy behind right. that. So, which means you have people that are in positions in these department heads that know that when it's a term limit, they know you're only going to be there for a certain <laughs> amount of time. Right, so, right. You, they'll, they'll aggravate the situation long enough until you're four or eight years, just like we do for the president, they have an a, a eight-year term. And right. so, they, you know, will say, okay, soon they're going to be out of here, so I don't have to worry about it. Right, so, right. If, we do the, if we do the term limits, we also have to put in uh, parameters so that those bureaucrats don't have more control than the people that were elected to make the policies. And so I agree with that balance because I even have um, even supported legislation for term limits, uh, well, resolution uh, for term limits when it comes to that. But I definitely do believe there should be term limits, but at the same time, making sure that there's policies in place. And if you have a person that's a department head that's been there too long, and they're right. not being effective. And I've seen that even on the state level where I had to oh, challenge yeah. some people that said, well, I've been here. And I said, well, you could be gone too. Um, <laughs> right. And so but right. I think that, you know, that has to be put in place to safeguard the, um, the trust that the people that are putting to you right. as an right. elected official, knowing that you're the one setting the policies for those departments uh, to be able to follow. Right. I lived in Michigan for a while and they do have term limits, you know, in their, uh, their house. And, but I do agree with you that there needs to be, um, you know, there needs to be uh, some, some, if you will, watchdogs, you know, concerning the, the bureaucracy that takes place uh, behind it. Um, wait, Representative Stovall, I had a question to come for me. So before I let you go, let me check this question. It says, what are your thoughts on 45 trying to make <laughs> three terms? He says he deserves it. Do you have any thoughts on that, of him trying to make three terms? I have thoughts on anybody trying to make three terms. Uh, <laughs> the, the Constitution says two term right, limit. Right, right, and every right. since we have we had presidents that since I've been born and even before, they have been two terms. So you get to gather together, you know, your, your first four of what you plan on doing, working with um, the legislative branch of government. 
to make sure you're able to implement all of those things that you want. So I don't know where this three-term um, idea came from for 12 years. No, eight years is good enough um, right. if that's what the people decide. And if the people decide they want to do three terms, let the people decide. Let that be a constitutional amendment decide. on the ballot. Right. Um, just like we had to do anytime we're changing our constitution that's already been established. That's right. why it's important, like you said earlier, about voting and about educating the voters on what power they have when they're going to that polling precinct. You have a lot of power, even though you might not see it directly. And you must vote every time. Don't just vote during the presidential election. You must also vote um, for your local election. Like you have school board that's going to be on there. Your judges are going to be on your ballot, which is very important because right. you want fair judges when you have to go before them in, uh, in court. You have your county commissioners that are on this ballot, your state house and state uh, representative, uh, state senate and representative. You have your public service commissioner that are up for re-election in certain areas. Uh, so this is a very important election. But remember, Stovall, that's all on number 16 on the special election. So I want you to vote for everybody else, but stop by number 16 on the ballot and right. vote Stovall. Representative Stovall, I can't say thank you enough for joining us uh, today here on WCEG uh, Worldwide Community Empowerment Group uh, Network. You have uh, really enlightened our listeners and gave us so much uh, information. Uh, and it's just, it's amazing to, to be able to communicate with someone who is so educated. You know, you have some that will get on here and just talk, you know, who they are and everything about them. But in conversation with you, you know, you gave us meat, you know, and something more to think about and, and something to know moving forward with what you'll do and how you'll represent us, uh, you know, in, in, in the uh, U.S. Senate. And I thank you so very much. Uh, I would like to, you know, mention that we do have a special election for uh, District 5, U.S. Congress or U.S. Representative District 5, uh, which was previously held by uh, the late uh, John Robert Lewis. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, as Representative Stovall has said, it is of utter importance, of uber importance, and any other thing that you can come to mind with the word importance that you get out and exercise your right to vote. Something that she has continued to say, and I like that, is that the people decide. Uh, our Constitution says it itself, we the people. And it's so important, ladies and gentlemen, that you focus on the fact that we have a lot of power in numbers and we the people have all the power uh, in making this democracy back what it used to be, something to be proud of. And so again, Representative Stovall, thank you so very much for joining us today. Um, last thing, ladies and gentlemen, voter registration deadline is October 5th. If you have not already registered, please make sure that you register by October 5th. Um, any last words, Representative Stovall? Uh, no, just thank you that we emphasize it. Uh, you can go and check your voter status at um, mvp.sos.ga.gov or you can google georgia secretary of state and you would need to check your status before you actually go and vote to make Correct. sure that you have not been purged uh, from the role of taking out because you've been voting for so many years or they right. tried to send you a letter you moved and you didn't get it so there's a lot of things that uh, play into that and, uh, and definitely, uh, so many people are confused about this election cycle with the special mm -hmm. election for the U.S. Congress 5th right, um, right. District. That is just to fill out the remaining term of Congressman Lewis, which will be yes. till January. And right. then on the ballot in November, you're going to see another um, selection for a 5th Congressional District. That's for the new term that's going right. to start uh, in January, all the way for two years. So there are two different times you're going to see something on the ballot for U.S. Congress right, 5. Right. I live in the 5th uh, Congressional District. I was very disappointed with the Democratic Party on how oh they God. handled that selection. They were not fair to the citizens of Clayton County. We did not have anyone there to look at who the nominees were, uh, the people that submitted their names, and that was unfair. And even when it was brought to the attention of the chair, uh, nothing was done. It was like we've already sent out the press release and now well, you can send out another press release because fairness is fairness. And so I think that the voters in, uh, in the 5th District were suppressed, and it was unfortunate uh, for that. So definitely you all get out to vote. If you live in the 5th Congressional uh, District, um, definitely vote. And that kind of goes back to what I talked about, about, you know, the Democratic Party. You, uh, you want to be loyal to a party, but that party is not loyal to you. And so everybody can think about that um, when right. they're voting um, this election. 
Right. Representative Stovall, you, <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth. Thank you again so much for joining us here on WCEG, the Worldwide Empowerment Group, uh, here on the people's choice we thank you best of luck to you uh and i you know I, i'm just gonna put this out here uh, if you need a, a page when you get up to uh to uh dc don't hesitate to call joe flynn i'll come and work hard for you i uh, thank you so much all right thank, thank you, you enjoy your day ladies and gentlemen thank you for joining us again here on wceg network the worldwide the worldwide community empowerment group we appreciate you so much uh, for all that you do, and we appreciate you for joining us. Yes, that was my plug <laughs> to get in. Uh, well, on, you have on, not, uh, if you ask not. That's, that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. So again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, Representative Stovall. Onward and upward to you. Take care, ladies and gentlemen. Bye-bye.